Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about fostering a learning culture using Parcel Kanban. And before we start, a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently an engagement manager at uh, OutSystems. How many people are familiar about OutSystems? Everybody in Lisbon probably is. Uh, 20 years in IT, rose from a developer, business analyst, project manager, whatever they wanted me to do. The CEO kind of thing, do chef or a janitor, I've done it all. Uh, ended up with our systems, and uh, in my free time, uh, that was a professional part. And the free time, which I try to find, I do volunteer a lot with uh, communities. That's how I have kind of kindled my passion for uh, agility. And I started volunteering with uh, Scrum Alliance, then it was uh, PMI and PMI as a community of practice. So I've basically led a little uh, few small groups um, and a global organization which was called uh, PMI's Adapt Community of Practice. So I was one of the team lead on the knowledge management part there. And uh, if you are, please feel free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, again, Twitter, I am purely me which is you can uh, expect things which are professional, non-professional, food, fun, all of it. So, just before we follow, I wrote the description. <laughs> <laughs> uh, generally, this, pro, this talk that I'm doing, I've uh, it up four or five times with my wife, Nina. Uh, it's, it's a two-part thing that we do. Uh, she couldn't be here because she's working at uh, with a different company, not with our systems. So I'll try to do it, the solo version for it. Um, I think this will sound familiar to you that uh, generally how is a day in the life of a software person? What we do is, have you ever actually instant messenger users, Slack, this, that? Have you ever had a problem where you are doing something pretty important but you get constantly picked. You have your status on the DND. Do not disturb me, but still ping, tank, ping, some of those kind of chimes. If that's not good enough, then your boss comes in. <laughs> so there, your boss is like, okay, you need to do this thing before you're actually uh, going to get anything done. So while you are doing all this stuff and you're asked to shift your con context, from one to the thing to another. How does it feel? Because what I do is, uh, many times what happens is, I do a lot of work. I feel that I have been busy the whole week, but when I go to time sheets to enter my time, uh, what did I do? <laughs> Absolutely. So, what happens is, what are the feelings that come to your mind when you look at this picture? Some of the feelings that you can describe. Sorry? Frustration. Frustration? Stress. Sorry? Stress. Stress. Some more? Feelings? Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed? Not okay. in control. Not in control? Well, you absolutely are right about all of that. And something that has helped us, me, my wife, and a few more people, is a tool called Personal Kanban. How many have people here are familiar with Kanban or using it in some or other fashion? So many people know it. Great, this is going to be a wonderful conversation. The word for people who are actually hearing for the first time, how many people are hearing uh, the Kanban word for the very first time? Okay, so people who know it, can you tell me the meaning of it? Let's make it an interactive conversation. Personal Kanban actually means, in Chinese, signboards or billboards, okay? Large visual board. And in Japanese, it means your signal card. And I, as you know, Kanban came from lean manufacturing. So you probably then know that Lingard from that Lean Manufacturing, David Anderson brought uh, Kanban to software. Now, here's an interesting part. 
what happened there was it definitely was personal Kanban was derived from the Kanban part. But how did it come in existence? So this was created specifically by Jim Benson and Corey Laris. And what they were doing is they actually were working with David Anderson on a project. And in their Kanban implementation, they were seeing that something is missing. Something was missing and not making sense. And what that was, every individual person's work that they were not showing up on the board was creating the problem <coughs> in their Kanban. That's how personal Kanban came into picture. So Jim partnered with Tony Ann and uh, created the award-winning Chingo award-winning personal Kanban book. And uh, that's pretty famous. And they have uh, their own product, Modus Operandi uh, has their personal Kanban website. So, lot of great information uh, on personalkanban.com. So, what personal Kanban is, is actually it helps us create value by working effectively. It's, it's a simple tool. It helps you get most value from the work that you're doing. It has simple rules. Few simple rules that allow you to control the flow of work. Anybody, any guesses what those rules could be? Keep work in progress. Correct. Another? Choose the most valuable tasks or user stories to enter. Something like that. So basically, right. So basically, it's visualize your work. Whatever you are going to do, make sure you are visualizing. And you are limiting your work that is going in progress. Those are the simple rules. With those two simple rules, Kanban is very flexible. You can see actually some implementations of it. You could call those stickies out there as your personal Kanban. It could very well be somebody that, if I can read it, Julio or Joe or something, it's their uh, personal Kanban there. What they are doing is they are making their work visible. I uh, don't see about web limit, but that's some and representation of a personal Kanban. So with these two rules, this is generally how Kanban's personal Kanban mode is modeled. Now, if you see this, what does what are the few things that come to your mind? Looks like a rule list. Many people are probably familiar with uh, GTD, get things done to do this. Um, it looks like a to-do list, but it is not a to-do list. And why? So here's what I would like to share, uh, basically our story that tells us how we realized that personal Kanban was not really just crossing something off of your big list. A few years ago, uh, my wife uh, got critically ill, uh, she had to undergo an emergency uh, surgery. And that meant uh, she's also a software uh, in software. She works uh, at Xcalibur. So through that surgery, she had like uh, later six weeks of bed rest. Somebody who's pretty active as her, uh, knowing Megana, that was going to be really really hard. At that time, we lived in an apartment which was three floors up and down. So she didn't even have the strength to go up and down three flights. So what started to happen was during her recovery, uh, which is post a traumatic stuff because uh, nobody likes surgery. Anybody likes surgery? <laughs> so after that uh, life changing kind of a surgery, which you have a lot of depression and that kind of stuff and healing in that kind of an environment doesn't help. So what happened, uh, what started to happen was I could see she was getting uh, really frustrated being just at home and that was affecting not only her but the caretaker and the people around her which was the had family. At a point I decided okay let's do something so as soon as I realized something needs to happen here what she was getting frustrated was she's not doing anything which wasn't actually true so even when she was doing nothing she was doing a few things that she is regularly supposed to do. 
Take our medicines. Probably, uh, you know, uh, got so there's a plant in our house that we had. So she would a uh, few plants that she had potted, watering those plants, talking to her, stuff like that. But none of it she considered as things getting done. So what I did was, you know what, Megana, let's do one thing. I brought up three flip charts. Things to do, things you're doing, and things you did. And I asked her, well, walk me through your routine, what you did today. She was like, nothing, I did nothing. And I said, no, you did something. And you did few things that you are not acknowledging. So we started putting stickies together, and she could see that, okay, for every small thing that she has done, there was an acknowledgement to that. Then I started to ask her, what are the few things that she has to do next? And uh, she started putting stuff like, okay, I have to probably call the medical insurance company, I have to pay some bills and things like that. So there went a few more stickies up on the wall, that what, these are the things that she needs to do. A few days later, I asked, I said to her, you know, when you start doing this work, just move them to do it. And when you're finished with that task, just move it to the done part. Two or three days later, many of those stickies had moved over to that. At that point, I might have asked, how did you feel doing this? And she looked at some of the stickies saying that, okay, uh, these bill paying and insurance related stuff keeps bringing, haunting me back with the whole uh, you know, illness part. I didn't really like that. But potting the plants, um, talking with my brother, sister, family, you know, taking some small steps every day, reaching my, uh, reaching my goal of walking 10 steps a day, 15 steps a day, it helped me. So those were the things that she actually felt better when I the progress made. So that was kind of our first just-in-time retrospective. At that moment, what happened was she realized that there is a kind of work that's helping her gain confidence and moving those stickies, there is some kind of an adrenaline or good, I don't remember the exact word for it, but it's kind of a positive sense that's going through the body, which is helping her mind and actually helping her in her recovery. So she, this is what helped her see that this is not just a to do list because before that she had those to do lists and she would like go in, in the digital to do list and she would just delete, delete, delete or scratch that. It didn't make sense. On the contrary, when she saw the to do list, she would be overwhelmed with it. So that's how she learned to see about her own choices. So what next absolutely happened here? At she actually aspired to see what's happening. She put her faith in that experiment that we tried to do. It made her aware about what are the kind of choices that she's making, what is all in front of her, as well as when she started doing stuff that made positive influence on her, she actually started to see, if I like this kind of work, why not do some more of it? And if I have some negative feeling work, she started to see if she could offload that to me or something like that. So remove the negativity, amplify the positivity. And that made, and she did that because she said, okay, let me try this. So basically she made herself vulnerable to the situation that she was in. Okay. What that means, she learned about herself and her own ways of working as a person. In our everyday life, we discount this. Each of a person here has a specific way and pattern of learning. Now, how do you define learning? What, what is learning for you? Anybody? You need to be first by what you do as well. Positively reinforced. Positively reinforced of what we do. So we had things you well in general. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's a good one. Anybody else? Acquiring knowledge that's useful for different situations. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's an act of acquiring a skill or a knowledge that actually 
or potentially helps you get better. That's the fact of it. So, as you can see, Megara through that experiment actually was able to learn about her own ways of working. Now, let's get into there are multiple models of learning. There are many people who have uh, looked and created different models. I'm going to talk a little bit about Chris Argyris uh, and their uh, single loop and double loop learning model. And we'll see how it fits into the puzzles. Uh, and I know we're talking about personal Canva and now the learning. Uh, let's see how this goes. So single loop learning, uh, which Chris Argyris <coughs> and uh, his colleague uh, created, it's a form of learning where you're just fixing the problem. You see a problem, fix the problem, move on. Okay? That's what you're doing is um, you're trying to adjust within the constraints of the system. You're working with the system, it can be agency, it can be a team, it can be your environment. And within that environment, you're just find the problem and just solve it and move ahead. Now, an example of this is a simple thermostat. We are feeling very, very cozy here right now. The thermostat was probably set to be around here. Uh, I don't know, uh, I'm Fahrenheit guy. <laughs> I know uh, uh, 20 degrees, 28 degrees, 22 degrees, whatever. So it's, it's maintaining that temperature right now. Because it sees that outside is bad and it's the, right now it's, uh, it should be 22. So it just does that part. Problem? When the room temperature drops down to below 20, it will turn back up, heat the thing up. That's a simple part. Now what happens generally in houses who have the single thermostat, even if you are coupling, that thing is going to still do the same thing. That regular thermostat is, regardless of what the situation is, as soon as the room temperature drops down, it's going to uh, trigger the thing. It's an inefficient way of handling stuff. Teams. What do teams do here? Not the back. So let me tell you a story of a team who kind of solved a problem. How many, as we saw all saw about Scrum, anybody wants to take a dig what, what's being shown here? Absolutely wonderful. What does it tell you? Sorry? It's, it is a burn on chart, although it's the thing that it at least looks like. <laughs> it looks like a burn on It should be a burn down chart. But this is a complex piece where what happened is this is a team, uh, multicultural, they, uh, you know, a team with uh, diverse uh, geographic locations. And what happened there was in this team, they were good configuration, uh, you know, we have like developers, QA, business analysts, product owner, and all that part. And sprint after sprint, their stories were not getting completely tested within sprint. It got to a place where the story that was created in sprint X was actually being tested in sprint X plus three or X plus four. Do you think that's a problem? Do you consider that as a problem? It got to a point where the team said, you know what, this is too much. Let's do a testing sprint. What does that sound like? <laughs> Waterfall. <laughs> so yes, okay, so when we showed this to the team, they were like, okay, let's let's do a testing sprint. And we did a full sprint, nobody else uh, doing any development and adding to the background. We all work on helping the testers, being testers, and we cleared the backlog. So, I keep going back. If you see, we were able to take that sprint and uh, do a little bit of adjustment and break, bring those whole work down. Can you see that? Okay. They're, they're bringing the style, you know, we are adding to the background itself and then finally we are making sure that what is being done. So, I was a part of this team. But that's, that was uh, what they, they were very happy about that, okay, we have fixed the situation. Now, fixing the problem, which is like this, 
is what single loop learning is all about. The team rejoiced. We went back, back to our regular development. So what essentially single loop learning talks about is look at the problem, fix it. Instead, double loop learning talks about we actually scrutinize the system and its constraints. When there is a problem, don't just fix the problem, but look at all the hypotheses that are inside it. Look at all the constraints that are inside it and challenge those constraints. So that's a model of double loop learning by Chris Olgari. Now, in case of our regular thermostat, instead of regular thermostat, now we actually install the Nest thermostat. What it does is when we are awake, we have set the setting away to not heat. A lot of energy saved, a lot of, you know, you know, and not empty space being, you know, heated and stuff like that. So Nest sends us monthly report, how much energy you have saved and stuff like that. That was great. But the same thing. What do you think happened after we got back to our regular practice? Sorry? Got back to the old pattern. <laughs> yeah. So sprint 37 is probably when we completed the testing sprint. Sprint 43, we are back to creating the mm -hmm. testing back so, they saw the pattern. One thing that they did was they saw the pattern happening ahead of time. And what they did was in this time, they are like, okay, we didn't do something right. Let's scrutinize what is it that we did not do right. And what they did was at that point, what they identified two things. The testers were not being involved early enough in the discussion of the user stories and testers estimations were not being used during the sprint planning. As soon as we found out those and fixed those issues, it started to slowly improve. If you can look at the line, it's not all over. We are making improvements that we are starting with a good amount of backlog and then actually going uh, here and making sure we are finishing up all that stuff. So this team, if you look at this last one, it is the same team and their burned down chart. And I would be proud if I were not to do And since then, they have been like this for a you know, good amount of time. What they did here was, instead of just fixing one particular thing that lets the stories that are going on, they actually challenged themselves and came together to help their own thing. Now, what that tells us, the one loop learning requires self-awareness. So the team members got themselves into a place that they came on and discussed as a team and opened up themselves to discussions. They were honest to each other and that is actually what helped them to take the responsibility that we shouldn't be just doing something, but we should change our processes. Instead of, are we doing think, the, the right things? Well, they started asking, are we doing the things right? <laughs> they moved their focus. So looking at that, what do you think is a better model of what helps us as individuals and teams to move forward? And if you are familiar with Daniel Kahneman's uh, work, uh, in his book he actually talks about system one and system two. So what that tells is, in system one, uh, which is more aligned to single loop learning, what happens is we give an emotional response to a situation. We just fix something that's really, really obvious and we think we have done uh, the work. But in the system two, we are actually looking at the whole system and making changes to the uh, system to make sure it works for us. So we use data driven. We were talking earlier, uh, somebody here mentioned the POs and the data for that. So yes, using the data to guide us instead of emotions helps us get better in 
that's why it um, opens up the communication. It uh, you know uh, allows us to test our assumptions and give uh, gives us a more freedom of choice of what are the options that we can use. So connecting before we go there. So mandatory limits, like because we are talking about manufacturing and this and that. I believe you probably identify with what Deming is saying here. That instead of doing something over and you know um, over and over and not uh, looking at the whole system is actually the kind of insanity. Uh, it, it's a sign of insanity. What Deming says is change that, and that aligns with the Bhutan learning. So single loop actually works at an operative level versus double loop works at a tactical level. Now, you'll be asking, why are we talking about this learning and these models? If you heard me say, it is all about the data. And what personal Kanban gives you is the data that allows you to adjust yourself and make changes accordingly every moment, every day, all the time you are practicing. You are looking at the data which is challenging to give you changes in your behavior. Of course, you have to be able to read it, you have to be able to understand it to make those changes. Now, how do we foster, uh, you know, that's what we are about, how, how do we create a learning culture. So once we saw that personal Kanban was working for us, we started doing experiments. Let's take it to the team. And what you're seeing here is uh, one of them is my wife's Kanban board. This is my Kanban board in the office. And we started to put our own stuff. People got curious, what are you doing here, how are you doing here, what, you know, what's happening. And what started to happen was when Meghna, uh, Meghna Sude, when she was working on multiple stuff, she's a product owner, so everybody from multiple stakeholders used to come in, uh, be new, uh, new features, or the production people who we have rolled out the product and they are supporting multiple those would come back and enter every, you know, the, the messaging or, you know, the boss coming in. Then she would show them, these are the things I'm working on right now. These are the next one that are lined up. Talk to me, see what this is, and tell me where your priority fits with respect to our organization and help me balance that. And that's how she made sure Everybody knew that limiting work in progress was actually helping the items get resolved instead of just fighting them on our plate. Uh, I took my personal Kanban uh, <coughs> accordingly. Uh, Meghna took that personal Kanban and she did this uh, with a volunteer group. So she was a part of a uh, Toastmasters group, and the Toastmasters uh, club, what she was doing was. She, when she was working, she saw that the whole team is not aligned. There were messages flying, emails, all of the stuff. So she just has created this digital board for the distributed team and made everybody's work visible. And in a few weeks, they were getting things done and people were actually pulling stuff voluntarily. That, okay, uh, I think that needs to be done now. I can do that, so let me help with that. So just by making the work visible, instead of just exchanging phone calls or things like that, it created a canvas where everybody could see what needs to be done next and they were on the same page. As a group, their communication improved. Now, we worked with the personal Kanban and a personal level. We worked with the personal Kanban potentially in the team's level where we showed our team members what we are working on. Volunteering. How do we use this in an organization? One of the stories I had is another uh, great architect I was working with in Atlanta. Um, this is our Georgia Department of Education project. And uh, that guy had a wonderful project. 
and he was the architect, it was his baby, and he was like, okay, we're gonna do as usual scrum, agile, and uh, we're gonna work. Okay. Everybody uh, went back, started working on their stuff. A couple of weeks or three weeks later, he was the product owner, the guy architect was actually getting agitated that nothing is happening, nothing is moving. So what's happening here? And his agitation every day and in a few weeks started to grow a little more intense. And when we saw that, I again had the same idea, let's do one thing. Went to every team member, what is it that you're doing? Okay, I'm working on that story, but that story is not moving. Why is it not moving? Because you know what? We are in the first uh, things, I have to do research. Which framework I have to use, what do I have to do, what authentication mechanism I am trying all that stuff. Are you talking and showing the story? Probably no. So got everybody's work together, put it up on the board, and then I brought in the architect. And that's when it hit him. That we all were running in different directions. That what all the work was actually getting done. So he was satisfied definitely that we are working. But what he was able to do was, he was able to guide the people who were actually going in the wrong directions. So instead of wasting the time in trying to do this option or am I going to use uh, you know, uh, 3DL architecture or 2DL architecture, which technology I'm going to use, what kind of authentication I'm going to use, all of that he was able to just answer and help us get into that. Second part says, how many people know here about the economy? A few people? Great. So, Jim was another, again, uh, instrumental in helping uh, to create a Lean Coffee bar. For the people who don't know, Lean Coffee is a simple way of um, wherever the people meet. It's, it's like an unstructured agenda. People who meet, they create the agenda for that meeting and people vote. So if, if we were at the table here, these three people would generate ideas of what they want to discuss as a group, they will vote on the ideas, they will hear each other's ideas that what's going to be, you know, what, what do you mean by your idea, what, what does it mean and then they would vote and basically do a backlog prioritization and then each item would get a specific amount of time, 8 minutes, 10 minutes, you discuss that topic, move it to done, lock in your learning you move it to done if you are actually, you know, at the end of the time box, eight or ten minutes, you ask, do you want to continue this topic? Am I getting value still from this topic or not? Uh, I'm not sure, and I'm really not getting value right now, so let's move on to the next subject. And Lean Coffee, uh, there are lots of blog posts, and I can share the links uh, how Lean Coffee is. There are most ideally done using post-its in front of people. There are uh, digital uh, tools that can be Lean Coffee. So why is Lean Coffee? Um, what I did was I, I got introduced to 20, uh, Lean Coffee in 2013. I have been using it in my workplaces. And one of my colleagues was, hey, I like this stuff. Why don't we use a Lean Coffee in our organization? So what we did was in our Systems Americas, I started to host a Lean Coffee. I invited a few of my engagement manager peers. Then some UX people joined in. Then some architects joined in. And we are like a group of 10, 15 people. So this is the way we are actually using the Lean Coffee. If people are familiar, this is leancoffeetable.com. Uh, that, that's the tool. And what we did was everybody came in and started sharing their ideas. Same, same part. What it helped us do was bring our frustrations to the table and new topics that we were interested in. Not, our, not only those, we found out some of those problems that we were facing internally, we were able to actually bring it to the table in our organization. And we were able to assign somebody to follow up on it. I'll give you a simple example. Timesheets, as uh, hard as a thing it is, we were frustrated with our way of entering timesheets. There came an action item that please improve timesheets few months before or actually uh, nearly a year before now we have a new timesheets app. 
it didn't stay within the circle. That feedback was taken to the right people and implemented as a solution. We have our own internal uh, agile uh, project management too. We gave a lot of feedback on that. Guess what all of that made to It created like a product backlog for the team who was improving and uh, creating new features for that too. So before actually anything came from our customers, we were improving our tools. All these ideas were getting generated through the Lean Coffee Farm. Okay. So that's one of the things. We improved our finance and budgeting things. I know still they are sometimes done in Excel spreadsheet, but it helped us uh, improve the quality of the Excel spreadsheet, the communication. Um, we were able to create a delivery playbook within our own organization that uh, is now being shared with our partners and customers. All these ideas came through mutual shared understanding and learning. Okay. Well, you would say, how do I implement a Kanban? And that's a picture of Peter Kiros, my partner in crime at uh, of Systems. And he's the guy I kept bouncing stuff and he was like, you need to create your colorful Kanban over here. You need to bring Lean Coffee to the um, the team and the organization. Lean Coffee is not only uh, local to America now, it's being used across in our systems in different ways and actually improving a lot of other stuff. I don't know if UX has one, uh, UX team has one, but all the guild members or guild masters we call them, they meet and put a Lean Coffee. So you would ask, how do I implement the personal campaign? As you can simply see, you need a wall, some sticky. <laughs> and a sharpie. As simple as that. And get started. Now, you can actually, in the, it, it, the value stream that gets created is dependent on how you improve. We started with ready with done. At a point, our value stream had seven columns. And before we said things were done, we had a column which was for retrospectives. We made sure we are talking about those before saying that it is done. So there are different ways of implementing personal Kanban. What this all allows us to do is looking at every time you are creating something, you are doing a micro learning. And instead of move, you know, doing task-based learning that, have I learned something here? You move from task-based learning to habit-based learning. And you're doing it in small sprints or bites. You're experimenting with the work that you have, the patterns that you see on your Canva, and the value stream that you create. All of this was, uh, this work that I'm referring to is from uh, Marianne Wilkie. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name right, but Marianne is uh, an organizational coach, and uh, uh, what she does is, she has a PhD and stuff in uh, organization learning part. I think Rabbit Home Learning is uh, her organization. And she shows that if we can use learning in small batches, keep experimenting, and use targeted feedback, you are going to improve. If I look at all that part, your personal Kanban board, either for you or your teams, is actually achieving those for you. What it's doing is, it's allowing us to go from acquisition of the knowledge to experiencing what's happening for us and moving to introspection and actually creating shared stories, which is what I'm doing right now. I acquired 2007 8 something, oh, what's this? Let's try it. And started experiencing, and it gave me an opportunity to be here with you to talk about it. It's cool, isn't it? Some sticky skin. <laughs> Now, here are a few of the individual experiences that we asked our colleagues. They all heard our story, they saw us do stuff, and they started asking, how can I do that? Some of them were vulnerable enough to, okay, teach me, show me, get me started. And when we shared that with them, here is Barbara. So, Barbara was recently got married, uh, it was when uh, and she was like, I would want to use it for my um, wedding planning. And that's where, if you see her thing, 
her husband and um, she were getting stressed but her husband saw the value and actually allowed them to communicate together um, with the wedding plan and they had a successful wedding. I'm not going to read the part but it's a cool story that um, she used personal Kanban to plan her wedding. Another uh, person, Eric Wiley, he actually uh, used personal Kanban for, as an idea board for himself. And he has actually, he's not with us anymore in the uh, systems organization, but he took this idea of lean coffee and personal Kanban to where he has gone. And he keeps sharing his stories with me that they are doing really uh, good with those practices. So it, he uses it as a can, canvas, like what is it that I have to do, what are my things that are, that are valuable to me, and it actually gives him clarity and completeness in his work. Similarly, uh, one of Medina's friend, Ariel, <coughs> that's her, that she used it specifically for you know, a writing part. She's a writer kind of thing, so it's, it's basically helped her gain a lot of confidence in her work, and um, move ahead with that part. So these are some individual uh, testimonials who used personal camera. Now, shifting the focus from individual to teams to organizations, what it actually means is it's a community of practice that we're creating here. Everybody who's listening, practicing, or even remotely interested in something like this, you are a part of a big uh, community of practice. And it's all about learning and sharing what we learn from that. That will help us grow this. Be it Scrum, be it Canva, be it project management. The more you provide people the platform to share their stories, the more viral it will go. So, last but not least, I really appreciate you listening to me about being here and the person who made that happen, Pedro and David, so thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate the sponsors and organizers and you all for sticking together, uh, sticking in this definitely the weather, but being here for us. This all thing uh, couldn't have been possible without the guidance and support from Jim and Tonya. Yes, they are the authors, and uh, we do. Uh, we have met virtually many times. Actually, uh, when Jim learned about our story and the blog and stuff like that, he actually asked us to do a video interview on personal Kanban. So uh, we are we are on the feature list of many speakers that they interviewed. So that was cool. Marianne and George for helping us drive what is organizational culture and you know giving us feedback on this part. And of course, Megna for being the pillar of everything. So, thank you for allowing me to share for how personal Kanban has affected our lives. These are the references that we have used. And now, definitely, if you have any questions, I can definitely take some of them.